Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, Medical Grand Rounds. Bob Walker, Chair of the Department. Uh, welcome to a small but mighty group here in, uh, in, in uh, 217, as well as uh, I think 30, 40 people online and growing. Um, this is a special uh, several days for us because this is our annual Holly Smith uh, lecture and our annual Holly Smith visiting professorship. Uh, tonight, there will be the annual Holly Smith uh, dinner uh, for, uh, for our faculty to celebrate some of the achievements of the department. Uh, so it gives us a chance, and I'll very briefly uh, uh, reminisce about Holly Smith. This is Lloyd Hollingsworth Smith, who was the chairman of the Department of Medicine here from 1964 to 1985. Uh, when Holly came here from Harvard, this was a backwater, and many people at Harvard wondered what, what had uh, gotten into his, his brain to make this big trip to UCSF, but he saw in UCSF the potential for greatness, and really under his leadership, he made it so. Uh, the pillars of the way we think about UCSF today uh, the multi-hospital system, the interconnectedness between clinical care and research, the importance of mentorship and of medical education, uh, and I think probably most of all the culture, the culture of working hard but not taking yourself too seriously, uh, were all things that Holly brought to UCSF and I think uh, remain his, uh, his legacy. Uh, and certainly by the time he was done, uh, it was the furthest thing from a backwater. It was really one of the great uh, medical institutions uh, across all of its missions in not only the United States, but in the world. So this is a nice opportunity for our department to celebrate uh, Holly's uh, legacy and what he has built. Uh, Holly was a true innovator. And so uh, we're actually thrilled to have as this year's Holly Smith visiting professor, uh, another true innovator uh, who Holly, I think, would have admired greatly. And so I'm uh, really thrilled that David Ash is here. Uh, David is the Senior Vice Dean for Strategic Initiatives at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, also the John Morgan Professor, uh, and he has also a professorship in the Wharton School of Business. Uh, David has spent the last 20 or 30 years thinking about how to make the healthcare system better using lots of novel methods and ideas. Uh, he directed the Center for Health Equity Research and Promotion, I think in an era where not many people were thinking about health equity, but it was front of mind for him. Uh, he also was executive director of Penn's Leonard Davis Institute of Health and Economics, really one of the top uh, institutions in the country and the world that thinks about the intersection of healthcare and economics. Uh, he was executive director of Penn Medicine Center for Healthcare Innovation from 2012 to 2022. And his research, which has really been pioneering, is in the intersection of behavioral economics and how uh, physicians and health systems make their choices. Uh, if I went through all of his honors and awards, I would take up all the time, so I won't do this. I will say he's an elected member of the Association of American Physicians and the National Academy, and he's won several of the really major awards that are uh, uh, in American medicine for his, uh, his work in, in healthcare innovation, healthcare economics. So thrilled to have him with us. This is a uh, grueling visiting professorship. He's probably already met with about 15 people. He's got about 15 more, uh, but it's been a delight so far. And we're really very happy that David has come to visit us. Uh, he was originally supposed to come and visit us in, uh, in uh, spring, 2020, and then you may recall something happened. So this has been a three-year delay, but we're glad uh, he's able to make it. So David, welcome so much. Well, thank you, Bob, and thanks to all of you. It is a total honor to be here uh, under any circumstance, but particularly one that recognizes Holly Smith who I did know and uh, met, and I can tell you that story later. Um, but anyway, it, it gives me really special pleasure here. And it's maybe a grueling visit. I don't think so. It's been totally fun uh, to meet uh, so many of you, and I, including some old friends, very, very distant friends, in fact. Uh, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. So I entitled this um, Automation, Emotion, and Behavioral Economics in Health and Healthcare because I wasn't sure what I was gonna talk about when I was asked for a title. And I thought I would include as much as I possibly could so that it would at least be somewhat truthful because this is a medical talk. I will mention some disclosures and I'm a partner in a behavioral economics firm and my institution has received um, grant funding from some organizations, but we're a small but mighty group here. I figured I would share some other disclosures while we're at it, just so we can all get uh, to know each other. Um, so, uh, you know, I, it's impossible really, you don't even have to be in the medical field. You could pick up a newspaper any day if you still pick up newspapers or at least read them on your phone 
and find some amazing discoveries, you know, mRNA vaccines, CRISPR Cas9 gene editing. I mean, the idea that you can edit someone's nucleotide sequence you know, in their cells, CAR T cell therapy that you can, you know, program your T cells to seek out the cancer in your body and kill it. Transcatheter aortic valve replacement. You know, when I went to medical school, the idea that you could replace someone's aortic valve without cracking their chest would have been completely unheard of. These are completely amazing things. I think they amaze all of us. At the same time, we constantly hear this refrain, why can't healthcare be more innovative? And I'm thinking like, really? Like, so that's not, that's not enough. You need more there. And I think, I think the explanation is that we're amazed by the things on the left side of the screen, but what amazes our patients are things like this. It took four months to get my mother an appointment with a neurologist. She waited two hours in the waiting room. Later, she got a huge bill that read right up at the top, this is not a bill. So when people, that's a, so the resolution of this paradox is when, when people think that they want healthcare to be more innovative, they mean often in service delivery and how we treat patients as customers, frankly, how we treat clinicians. That's the kind of innovation that people are looking for. They're also looking for the innovation that's on the left side of that screen, but that's the resolution of the paradox. So in many ways, the battle is for the customer interface. I borrowed this from someone named Tom Goodwin who wrote it almost 10 years ago, but I think it's just as apt. Uber, at least at the time, was the, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, the world's most valuable retailer, has no inventory. Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. Each of these companies created and actually captured enormous value by being at the interface of customers. We're in the healthcare business. We're not about to give up the tactile elements of surgery and imaging and prescribing medications, and all of those things that we do. But as an industry, largely, we have devoted almost no effort to the customer interface at a time when at least these four companies, as I said, created and captured enormous value. We could at least do a little bit in that direction. Now, it's the year 2023. If this were 50 years ago, and this was not a grand rounds, but a meeting of the banking industry, someone might have said something like this. You know, most of our customers engage with us through our bank tellers. Therefore, um, even if they're later referred to someone who's behind a desk, therefore to help our customers, we must make it easier for them to get in front of bank tellers. Now, I don't know if anybody said anything like this in 1973 at a banking conference, but I can tell you that is not the direction that banking went in 1973 because 1973 was the time when ATMs first really appeared on the market. And, um, and of course, we, you know, if I were to talk about ATMs with my kids, they wouldn't even understand what that was, let alone think about the gyrations and contortions my parents used to go through, or I used to go through, till I get to a bank between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. Monday to Friday to take out the $30 that would feed a family of four for a week or for a month at that time, right? So we moved from bank tellers to ATMs and now to Venmo and other forms of digital transformation at a time over a period of not far less than 50 years when healthcare has not changed very much. Now, often making services more efficient is actually about removing people. My mother's not alive anymore, but when she was alive, she lived on 78th and 3rd in Manhattan. And when she died about a dozen years ago, I'm pretty sure that the Chase Bank on 79th and 3rd fired their last bank teller because I think she was the only one who went in there to use that because um, she needed a kind of emotional connection. So often making services better is also about making them more emotionally comfortable. And that's a, that's a tension I think that we have as we think about the new, I don't wanna call it the new economy, maybe the new industry of healthcare. Um, before I go deeper into this, I wanna have like the, air, the airing of grievances. Remember that on Seinfeld, you know, Festivus begins with the airing of grievances. So, you know, here's one, company CEOs who believe that their success in like the aluminum industry suddenly makes them an expert in healthcare, right? That I find that like that's fingernails on a blackboard to me. Um, business school professors, actually I am one, with a seven point plan for like improving the fast food industry, they, they, they think can be translated into improving healthcare. 
or people who ask why healthcare can't be more like Amazon, right? That also is a kind of fingernails on a chalkboard uh, thing. Healthcare is different, right? It's high stakes, it's highly regulated, it's capital intensive, but clearly there's got to be something that we can learn from other industries that is applicable uh, to making uh, healthcare better. So let, let's try this little audience participation. You've all used Amazon. Why? What's good about it? Shout, shout some things out. What do you like about Amazon? Lots of options. Lots of options. Convenient. Convenient. Fast. 100% guarantee you have what they have what you need. Okay, 100% guarantee. Like, so they have everything. Great reviews. Cheaper. Great reviews. I love that. Right. So here's, here's my list. Pretty much yours. We could go on and on. Huge selection, lower price. The ratings and testimonials. Can you explain that to me? Who said that? Who said the great reviews? Why, why are there? I, I don't get this. So I'm searching Amazon for my son. My son has an allowance. He wants to buy something. We go on Amazon. And I'll search on Amazon. He said, let's look at the reviews. I want to know if it's scam. It's actual crap. Like, those are his words. And he knows that he like, reads the reviews carefully enough. And an eight-year-old. He can suss out whether like he's going to get his value for his allowance versus crap. Yeah. So I, I understand that the I understand why the scam reviews are there, but why are the real ones there? Like, so if I'm buying a toaster, I love the reviews. Like, but people are writing like love letters to the crumb tray on their toaster. I don't understand what motivates people to do this. It's very useful to me if I can sort out the, the scamming. Anyway, it's a it's a it's an interesting feature of that. So if someone says, why can't healthcare be more like Amazon? I find that irritating unless I say, well, which part of Amazon, right? Because Amazon is not a single thing. It's all of these things. And when you break it down to something slightly more elemental, then the question begins to make more sense and we can begin to make more use of it. I also think that things like online retail have enabled lots of stuff that is useful to keep in mind, right? So I don't know if you've seen this expression, the acronym IWW, IW, whatever, I can't even read it anymore. It's I want what I want when I want it, right? So that, like, that is a very powerful force. I don't just need the toaster. I want, like, I want it now. Uh, this would not be good in healthcare, um, where we should have I want what I need when I need it. And it's possible that some of that culture, you know, underlies some of the challenges we have with epic in-basket messaging now a kind of immediacy that is that is dribbled over into other parts of our lives. It's allowed market entry. And of course, online retailing has, has allowed the long tail. Many of you probably know something about the long tail. I guess Amazon's first industry was really selling books. Even the big box bookstores like you know, Barnes and Nobles could, could keep only so many books on their shelves because of inventory controls. But if you were to look at, look at the, um, the long tail, there's at least as much area under the curve of demand in the long tail that is solved by online retailing. If you, if you live in a small town and you have unusually sized feet or an unusual taste in shoes, you can't, you can't manage without Zappos, right? So that, that is a kind of market uh, approach. So the best example of the long tail in some respects is eBay. Um, it's really almost been 30 years ago since it was founded. Uh, some of you may know this story it was founded by a man named Pierre Omajar, the first item auctioned was this broken laser pointer that was lying on his desk and he puts it on this online new online auction site and suddenly bidders appear and they bid it up and, and the and the broken laser pointer sells for fourteen dollars and eighty three cents and omadyar is astonished and he contacts the buyer to try to figure out you know why did you buy this and and the response was I am a collector <laughs> of broken laser pointers. I, it, it, there is an ass for every seat. I, and so the, the reason I bring this up and go through this is that online retail designs for discovery. And if you think about it, I'm gonna come back to like the learning health system issues. Successful businesses don't assume they know what their customers want. Who would have thought that someone might want a broken laser pointer? They are, set up to learn what their customers want and how to deliver it. And I think that is one of, one of the transportable lessons from other industries that can go uh, into healthcare. Most of the time, I think, this, I mean, I made this slide as a joke. Unfortunately, it's very realistic. Most of the time, I think we have what I would call an unlearning health system. I think this is the dominant approach to decision-making in large organizations. I'll, I'll say like Penn Medicine, I won't necessarily tarnish UCSF with the same brush is that you'll have leaders who sit in a room with others who look and think exactly the way they do. They decide some approach is a brilliant idea, force 
someone lower down in the organization to implement it, congratulate themselves, never evaluate the progress, and then make the program a permanent part of the recurring budget because there's a kind of behavioral tendency to think differently about the things we used to do as opposed to the new things. The thing, our, our traditional budgets from that we roll over from year to year do not get the scrutiny of new programs, even though they should all be evaluated with the same sets of standards. So that's the unlearning health system approach. Online retail is often designed for discovery. So how, how many times have you, how many of you have tried to order something online and you get an out of stock message, right? Something like this. You're trying to order the mustard yellow cashmere V-neck sweater and you get this. Well, I, I, I hope I'm not the first person to tell you this. Often the item wasn't out of stock at all. It never existed, right? Online retailers will post believable descriptions, often CGI generated images of mustard yellow cashmere V-neck sweaters to see if there is demand. It's a very high fidelity way to check demand and they won't start knitting these things until they see that there's enough demand. And that's a really like a highly valid test of learning what your customers want. And you can think about how you might use that in healthcare. I mean, we, we try to be a little bit more truthy uh, as an industry uh, than retail uh, would be, but you can think about how these kinds of vapor tests um, could be useful for us. So here's a bunch, of, a bunch of companies, some of them don't exist anymore. They're in different forms, Kodak, had a near-death experience and emerged as something else. I think the last Blockbuster video closed this year in 2023, I think. I think it existed in a place that had very little broadband um, uh, 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 internet connection. You could think about how some of these industries or parts of them might engage in the healthcare enterprise. So like, what if um, Amazon now is in healthcare, right? What if they were in the business of doing colonoscopies, right? So. I think you'd see something that looks like this, a colonoscopy procedure from Holly Go Lightly. And they're great at cross-selling. And they would know, let me just tell you from personal experience, that there's some things you need when you're getting a colonoscopy and that might be toilet paper, or air freshener, or crossword puzzles to, you know, to do while you're on the toilet. But it wouldn't be any crossword puzzle book. It would be the large print kind because of the presbyopia that goes with the demography of, of getting uh, frequent or at least periodic colorectal cancer screening. And Amazon would be great at that. And we often don't translate those lessons into healthcare. Although um, having had an exceptional set of meetings so far, it sounds like many of you are already doing that at UCSF. And, and so uh, you know, you're, you're way ahead of the curve uh, of the rest of healthcare, which is no surprise. What if Ikea, you all know Ikea was in the business of doing hip and knee replacements. Right. So they're not in that business. I think you'd see instructions, you know, that were just better for people uh, for their hip and knee replacements. And it sounds like a bit of a joke. I mean, it is a joke. But of course, IKEA was they were masters of returning to the customer everything the customer himself or herself can do. Right. You you drive to the store, you lug the product off the shelf, you have to lug it home, you put it together with those little Allen wrenches. And now of course, hip and knee replacements are largely outpatient procedures. And a lot of the post-operative care and actually the pre-operative work is done by the patients themselves. And so learning of how you create a, a more self-service kind of organization is something IKEA was actually very good at doing um, because it was critically important for their business model. So there's lots of things to, to learn, at, learn about. We had this plan at Penn to try to make pen medicine normotensive, meaning we were gonna try to try to reduce undertreated hypertension among the employees of pen. And uh, we eventually developed this program in which we would just give uh, employees an ambulatory blood pressure cuff that cost about 30 bucks, a bottle of, I think we started with amlodipine, but I think we've moved on to different kinds of medicines. And then, at, then we, they would sort of text back and forth with an RN uh, to, get, to get their blood pressure managed. And you know, this is a little comparison. The, we found that the average um, primary care physician, it would take 12 months to get 30% of their patients at target, reflecting about a six point drop in their systolic blood pressure. With this program, we got 100% of our patients at target within six months with an 18 point drop uh, in blood pressure. And I think along the way, we tremendously reduced the amount of time, primary care time it took to get there. So it was just a, a huge efficiency. We got there because we thought about Jiffy Lube of all things, that if you 
need an oil change. You don't need to go to an oil car mechanic. You just need an oil change. And it's not that there isn't nuance sometimes with the management of hypertension, but there's not an enormous amount of nuance a lot of the time there. And could we like jiffy lube it? And that kind of analogy turned out to be very useful for us. And now we're like, we've been doing lots of refinements on this program to expand it beyond our own employees. I bring this up because I think this is a lot of the service productivity sweet spot that we've seen from other industries. We moved from bank tellers to ATMs to Venmo. A lot of people don't use tax preparers for their tax accounting now. They use some form of TurboTax. And I can't remember the last time I used a travel agent. It was probably 30 years ago, but it used to be you couldn't get plane tickets to San Francisco without using a travel agent. And Travelocity, I don't even know that exists. That was, I think, one of the first online sites. That, like that kind of automation we've seen in other industries. We're only beginning to see it uh, uh, in healthcare. And actually UCSF is like a great leader in that. Uh, so congratulations and all of that. So the sweet spot here is like some connect, everyone likes automation, data, AI, it's a new thing. Um, I do think as I, as I referenced my mother and, and Chase Bank on 79th and 3rd, emotion and behavior is the other side of that. And pretty much what I want to spend the rest of the few minutes talking about. I think the sweet spot is this area of facilitated self-service in which we can benefit from the automation that is seen in other industries, but do it in a way that is comfortable and consistent with what people want from their doctors and nurses and hospitals. And, and I think that's the challenge going forward. So before we get into the behavioral aspects of this, I guess I wanted to sort of, as I said, put aside childish ways. And I will acknowledge that I think that the most pervasive view of improving health behavior has been that both clinicians and patients make the best decisions when they have the best information in front of them. It's the idea that education is the main motivator to improving the health behaviors or of the clinicians or of the patients. And I'm not against education, but the question I would ask is, can we do better than that? And, and the reason I, I wanna say that we can do better than that is that education as a motivator assumes that people behave rationally. That if you give me information, I'm gonna process that information in my head and my behavior is gonna change as a result. And I think that's a very poor model of how actual decisions get made by real people. The old approach has been that to change someone's behavior, you need to change their mind. And I will just ask you to think for a moment, when is the last time you did that? That you were actually successful at changing someone's mind. Um, changing their mind is hard enough, changing their behavior, is harder still. It leads to the idea that we should educate people about the dangers of smoking. I'm not against doing that. The CDC has a big budget to reduce the harm from tobacco. A lot of that budget is to educate Americans that smoking is dangerous. I think most Americans actually already know that smoking is dangerous. Um, I made this, this part here before the pandemic, convince people that vaccination is safe. Uh, you know, I do not think that education is, is, a, is gonna be a huge part of the tools we need to improve vaccination rates and anything. I, I don't want to say it's not useful, but I don't think it's it's going to take us all the way we go. Instead, I think the mind is a high resistance pathway. I think it's one of the most inefficient ways to change behavior is to try to drive it through cognition. And this is the sort of behavioral economics mantra is that we if you if you hit my patellar tendon with a reflex hammer, my leg is going to jerk forward a lot faster and a lot more reliably than if I had to think about it because it's a reflex. Behavioral economics is about learning what our behavioral reflexes are and, and hitching our healthcare wagon to that. What will people be doing anyway? What's natural for them to do? And how can we harness that uh, to improve their decisions? So, you know, I'm, I'm actually quite optimistic about the field. The field of motivation has advanced tremendously in the past 20 years. We still rely heavily on information that assumes that people don't know the problem. If we would only educate them, they would do better. If only I knew that smoking was dangerous, I would stop smoking. We use an enormous amount of economics in healthcare. I mean, you know, the, the pay for performance approaches that go to clinicians for either productivity or quality, or the, all the co-payments and deductibles on your own personal health insurance, those are financial incentives directed at you to try to encourage you to move your healthcare in a particular direction. And there is evidence that they have some effect, not huge effects, by the way, Behavioral economics recognizes that people are 
irrational, right? Our decisions are affected by emotion, framing, social context. We don't always do what's in our own best interest. But the, the key lesson of behavioral economics is not that we're irrational. It's that we're irrational in highly predictable ways. It's the predictability of our psychological foibles that allow us to like design strategies, uh, you know, to, to attack them. I'm gonna list a couple of these irrationalities. I don't, I don't wanna go too deep into this, mostly to illustrate that we all have them. I mean, this is 50 years of research um, and, and uh, these are like pretty much hardwired into us. So present bias, this is, um, present bias is the bias that leads us to think that the outcomes right in front of us are much more important than even the clearly much more important outcomes that are in the future, right? So if I'm on a diet, someone offers me a luscious looking piece of chocolate cake, right? I know I should not eat that chocolate cake. That chocolate cake will land on that part of my body permanently where that kind of food naturally settles, but the cake's right in front of me. It looks so good and the diet can wait till tomorrow, right? This explains why people with hypertension who would desperately like to avoid a stroke and who know on some cognitive level that taking their antihypertensive is the best way to reduce their risk of having a stroke, often don't take their medications. The adherence for single drug therapy once a day, monotherapy for hypertension <clears throat> falls off to 50% at one year. Like think of how many lives we could save if we could solve that problem. Overweighting small, so what's the solution? Can you, can you make the rewards immediate? Like that's, that's, the, that's the argument, at least conceptually for why you might pay people today to take their medications. We're already paying for the drugs, maybe financial incentives to take your medications, like accelerate the benefits today. And there is some evidence that that works, although people freak out about the idea of paying people to take their medications. Um, overweighting small probabilities. People have a very hard time understanding low risks. It's hard to, hard to tell the difference emotionally between a, a one in 100 chance and a one in 10,000 chance. They both seem small. This is why state lotteries are so popular. Like state lotteries return pennies on the dollar. I mean, some of you may buy lottery tickets. They're like, it's fun. It's like you have the chance of striking it rich, but like it's not a good, it's not a good, good way to, to invest your retirement savings. I, I saw a bumper sticker. I'm not making this up. That said state lotteries are a special tax on people who can't do math. Um, so uh, my colleagues and I've done bunches of studies in which the rewards we deliver are lottery based rewards to try to juice them up, goose them up a little bit and, and, uh, and make them more powerful. Regret aversion. People hate, hate the feeling of regret. It's a very noxious feeling. That thing you could have done, that person I should have asked out to the prom that you know, I should have bought you know, that stock when it was here and sold it when it was here, all those things woulda, coulda, shoulda done. There was a, um, I can link these things. There was a mega jackpot lottery recently in my area. The payout was over a billion dollars. And everyone in my office is pooling money to buy lottery tickets. And I'm having none of it, right? I'm swaggering around the office. Lotteries are a special tax on people who can't do math. <clears throat> yeah, and then it hits me. What if they win? Right. You know, I'm the only one who shows up at work the next day. Uh, and it's not it's not that I didn't want my colleagues to win. I didn't want them to win without me. Right? So I, I handed over my twenty dollar bill. You know, I could, should have just put it in the shredder would have saved me a couple of steps. Uh, I you know, never saw it again. And I have a slide on this. That sense of regret was worth like to avoid that sense of regret was worth twenty dollars to me. And and. Um, uh, you know, in a, in a variety of studies, my colleague Kevin Volp and I have created a sense of regret for medication adherence so that you get prizes only if you had taken your medication the day before. And that has been shown to increase medication adherence for a variety of drugs for uh, hypertension and hyperlipidemia and the like. So you can harness these things, these attitudes and, and behavioral patterns that often get you into trouble and use them as forces of good rather than as forces of evil. And that's the point. Once you recognize how people are irrational, you're in a better position uh, to help them. So I'll give you some other clinical examples. Um, some of you may have seen this. We had a problem at Penn in which our clinicians were prescribing brand name drugs when generic drugs were available. And uh, they all, you know, the clinicians wanted to prescribe generic drugs, they were just in the habit of prescribing them as brand names, which is costing more money for our patients and for our insurance partners who we often care about. 
and nothing works. So each of these lines is a um, different molecule, a different drug, and they're ordered according to how often they were prescribed as generics. The ones at the top are prescribed as generics about 100% of the time. The ones down at the bottom are prescribed as generics less than 20% of the time. They're all pretty flat, suggesting nothing was really changing until someone put some piece of software in our epic like physician order entry part that defaulted to the generic drug unless you sort of dispense as written, uh, 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 unless you specifically selected the brand name drugs. And it doesn't take a statistician to see that this changed overnight, saving like I think $16 million over the first year and a half. Um, one drug didn't make it all the way up to the top. When I ask what that drug is, almost everyone thinks it's Viagra, but it's it's not, it is levothyroxine, right? Um, you know, perfectly reasonable to not switch your patients from synthroid, synthroid to generic levothyroxine because you have to titrate, retitrate them. Uh, uh, so nudges, nudges are small efforts with great influence. It's a behavioral economics trick. With all the meetings that I've already had here at UCSF, I've met people who are already using nudges in healthcare. I'm incredibly optimistic about that. Mostly I wanted to show this adorable picture. Um, and you've probably all had the experience or, or oh, actually no, looking out at the audience, maybe only some of you had the experience of using a urinal in a men's room. For, for those of you who haven't had this experience, I will share the news that there is pee all over the floor. And um, as you may know, you can, you can solve this problem by etching the image of a fly in the back of the urinal. And it makes perfect sense. If I see that fly, I'm gonna get that fly, right? That I don't need, I don't need instructions. I don't need, it doesn't say like, please aim at the fly. I don't need that. It's my that my lateral geniculate nucleus is telling me to do that. And the, uh, and I don't, it's, you know, so it, it works perfectly. It does, it does beg the question that if men can aim, why were they peeing on the floor in the first place? And frankly, if you're going to pee on the floor, could you pee? Why pee it in front of the urinal where someone else is going to stand, go pee in the corner where someone else is not going to be. But th that's a nudge that exists in other settings. And there are nudges throughout um, everyday life, right? If you order from Domino's pizza, you can't check out until they show you the chocolate lava crunch cake. They know you're hungry. Frankly, if you're ordering for Domino's pizza, you must be hungry. Um, if you order something from Amazon, the headphones from Amazon, they're going to cross sell the case for the headphones. You can't, I couldn't get a plane ticket to San Francisco without saying, no, I do not want the ridiculous flight insurance that you're trying to sell me. Um, if you're watching something on Netflix, it's going to default to the next episode to encourage binge watching. Uh, here's my here's my newest favorite one. Have you seen these ketchup bottles? All right. There's there's ostensibly there to show you the optimal pouring angle for Heinz ketchup. But you all know that is not the optimal pouring angle for Heinz ketchup. The optimal pouring angle is vertical, which is a different kind of nudge because I'm pretty sure these bottles are designed to make you waste ketchup. Like it's a perfectly like why would you ever design a ketchup bottle that way? Except if you wanted eventually it's to, to go all over your plate. We don't use these things for healthcare as intentionally as we might. And that's a design concept. I think the online world of retail is far more intentional in their design than we are in healthcare. We are just as smart. We just haven't thought to apply some of these skills elsewhere. A couple of other behavioral economics tricks. Framing, framing makes a big difference, right? Clergyman to superior, may I smoke while praying? Answer is no. May I pray while smoking? Yes. A pure framing manipulation. Um, here's another example of one done by my colleague, uh, Matesh Patel. We were trying to get employees at the University of Pennsylvania who are overweight or obese to walk more, at least 7,000 steps. We used the accelerometers in their cell phones, which are really just as accurate as Fitbits to, to measure this. So this was a forearm RCT. Uh, one group was just a control group. They got told whether they had walked 7,000 steps or not. Uh, another group got $1.40 for every day they walked 7,000 steps. Another group got the same $1.40, but it was in a lottery incentive that, that where the expected value was $1.40. And then the fourth group got the same $1.40 incentive, but it was framed as a loss rather than a gain. $1.40 a day is $42 a month. So we gave each of these employees $42 at the beginning of each month in a virtual account that they could see. And we took away $1.40 
for every day they didn't walk 7,000 steps. Now, I know an economist would say those last three financial incentives are identical because for every day you walk 7,000 steps, you're $1.40 richer. But a behavioral economist would say they're different because losses loom larger than gains. We're more motivated to avoid a $1.40 loss than to achieve a $1.40 gain. And that's what you see in the results here. The first three, well, the first two incentives in green and yellow were no different than control. People were no more likely to meet the 7,000 step goal. But those who had the loss framed incentive were 50% more likely to meet their step goal. And so now we try whenever we can do it in a non-noxious way to, to frame our incentives as a loss to try to goose them a little bit. And that's something that you wouldn't have thought about if you thought that people were rational all the time. It's not rational, it's just how we are. And we can use that as a tool in our toolbox. So I talked a little bit about financial incentives. Um, and frankly, a lot of the work that we did from the start in our Center for Health Incentives and Behavioral Economics was about financial incentives, but they're expensive. Um, they can seem inappropriate in healthcare. They're often can backfire. Um, and we've done a little bit more work now on social incentives, but I, I wanted to talk a little about the backfiring part. Um, and the best example I have is this study that was done in an Israeli daycare. Some of you may know this study. I see some nods of the head. So the problem, I don't, I don't know how many of you to, have used daycare, but the, the greatest sin you can commit in daycare is picking up your kids late, right? Everyone's unhappy. Your kids are crying because you don't love them, obviously. Um, you know, the teachers are upset they had to stay late. You feel guilty. Like there is no winner here. And so this uh, Israeli daycare uh, chain, I think, um, decided to do what a lot of U.S. daycares have done, which is that they installed a fine for late pickups. The fine they picked was, was 10 new Israeli shekels, which is about $3. And they installed that fine. And, and what happened? Late pickups increased. And if, if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Like, like, what a deal. For like 10 shekels, you can keep a kid all night. Um, but, but what was interesting about what happened is when they realized their mistake, they took away the fine and the late pickup stayed at the new high level. Like, you can't get the toothpaste back in the tube. There, was, there were strong intrinsic motivations to pick up your kids on time. And then they cheapened it by putting a price on it and they destroyed the social contract. And I bring this up because we all have strong intrinsic motivation and I am unconvinced that we are doing anybody any good. There is no evidence as far as I can tell that pay for performance intensive for physicians improves the quality of care. And uh, I mean, we see little bits of it in, in how we direct people with uh, patients with their uh, insurance plans, but I'm not sure this is the right way to go. I've been much more interested lately in um, social incentives. So um, here are a couple of images. I donated today's stickers. Why, why do we have those? Many of you have donated blood. You get, a, you get a orange juice, a graham cracker, and a sticker. What's the point of the sticker? People think you're a wonderful person. You know you're a wonderful person because you just had this 14 gauge needle in your anticubital fossa. And like that proves you're a wonderful person, but who else knows it, right? So it gives you status. People like to brag about that. I mean, it also probably prompts other people to do it, but the reason is to, to give you status. I voted, you know, I donated. People care what other people think about them. In the middle, upper middle, by the way, that is not President Obama, that is an Obama impersonator. But what is that Obama impersonator doing? Ice bucket challenge. Remember summer of 2014? Anybody do it? Do you remember what you had to do for the ice bucket challenge? Pour yeah, but you had to do a few other things. Pour a bucket of ice on your over your head and oh, film it. Oh, right. So it was it had to be packaged for distribution. And you challenged other people. I challenged Bob Wachter to do this. And so now what is that? That gives Bob Wachter status. If David Ash is challenging, them, that must mean something. And Bob would get up and he'd say, I wanna thank David Ash for challenging, challenging me to do this. It is a conferral of status. You confer status onto other people by calling them out, which is incredibly val valuable and motivating. We don't often think about that in healthcare. Movember, 
men growing facial hair in the month of November for men's health in general or prostate cancer specifically. Um, uh, there's a Mac laptop there. Anybody remember what was different about the very first version of the Mac laptop? You're, you're so close. So the, the comment here, uh, for those that didn't hear, it was a color decal on the Apple. The Apple was upside down, the other way around. So the Apple was right side up when the laptop was closed in front of you. You'd open it and the Apple was upside down to the rest of the world. That wasn't very useful, right? You, you already know you're cool. And like Apple products converse status. It's, you need, everyone else needs to see that. I mean, you could figure out what that was an Apple. Now to this day, I've got a Mac laptop and I'm constantly confused. You know, I put it in front of me with the Apple right up, you know, because I'm so egocentric. And, uh, and then I have to flip it around uh, to do that. Um, iPods, remember iPods? You know, not, not by, by no means were they the first digital music player, but they were clearly the most successful. They did a lot of things right. But one thing they did, there's a little clue in the picture there, The headphones were white, All right? So it's really the only visible part of the digital music player. Everyone could see that you had the Apple product. Again, Apple products confer status. How do I show everyone I had it? Everyone else's earbuds were black and they're still white to this day, as you know. And so, they, you know, people are always on their best behavior when they're being observed by other people. And we can think about how to use that in, in healthcare. That, that's the sort of social support question. We, now we can prescribe medications. How do we prescribe social engagement? That's not such an easy thing to do. Um, a colleague of mine, Judith Long, did I think a great study with patients who had hard to control diabetes, randomized those patients into three groups. One was a control group. One was a group that got financial incentives if they, if they could get their glycosylated hemoglobin down. And the third group or was paired with a peer mentor. This was someone who had previously had hard to control diabetes, but had managed to tame it. And all they had to do was talk on the phone once a week. They could talk about the price of Bitcoin. They could talk about the Taylor Swift concert. They could talk about anything. And what you see here uh, in the graph is that the usual care group had no change in the A1C. Um, the financial incentive group um, actually had a roughly half point decline in the A1C, which is not nothing that's pretty good but a one point drop in your hemoglobin a1c over across the population that's better than any blockbuster drug does in an rct that was a huge effect now this is um this is the alcoholics anonymous model applied uh, to diabetes that that people who enter aa are paired with a recovering alcoholic who's a peer mentor to them and i don't think we think about creating, we somehow sometimes have natural support groups that occur around cancer care and the like, but I don't think we have naturally thought about using this for chronic disease models and the like to help people, you know, uh, get better care in settings um, out, outside of cancer. And I even think that the cancer support groups aren't done particularly intentionally to solve problems that we might have um, in cancer care. So I'm going to, I'm going to make a shift and conclude, conclude with another story. Um, so that we have some time for questions. Um, and this is a, a project I wasn't involved in directly, so I, I feel more ability to brag about it. But it's about breast reconstruction. Um, as Bob mentioned, I used to direct our innovation center and we shared a floor with our plastic surgery division, just, just an accident of how we were cited uh, you know, within the hospital. And um, the chief of plastic surgery at Penn, a, a physician named Joe Cerletti, had pioneered this breast reconstruction um, approach that involved autologous transplantation of tissue from other parts of your body. And uh, not being a plastic surgeon, I'm not even going to try to get into the mechanics of this. But it apparently provides a much better result for the women who are getting breast, breast reconstruction following mastectomy for cancer. And there were long delays because Penn was at the time the only place doing this, long delays for this. And the problem we were asked to solve in the Innovation Center was to solve the long delay problem. And this is a, a representative quotation. There's so much anxiety with waiting. I wanted to be seen as so, soon as possible so I could get back to feeling normal. And so uh, a little bit of contextual inquiry into, find, in, into this 
uh, we, have, we had a bunch of designers working with us in the innovation center and the patients emerge effectively homebound um, and then have to return five times during what was a 90 day global period in which we were paid for drain management because they have multiple drains in their body now because this is autologous transplantation of tissue. Um, and each of those visits was taking them about five hours between door to door waiting in the waiting room. And often they had to bring someone along with them. Maybe it was a, 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 a spousal partner or an adult child came with them. So like 10 hours each way. And what the team did is they began to automate parts of the system to remove many of those visits. And some of those were done with home care nurses. That's a, a kind of automation that still involves human care. And some of it was based on, on text messaging. And the result, which I've summarized here, was that they reduced the five post-operative visits to one visit. And I've been talking with people at UCSF and other contexts where there's been some other uh, approaches uh, uh, to that all, uh, uh, in, in different clinical domains here. Five visits went to one visit, 20 hours of patient and family time went to five hours. This was like a huge success. And it solved the fundamental problem that we were asked to solve which is that freed up the plastic surgeons to greatly expand the number of patients they could care for with the same amount of staff because it offloaded work from the plastic surgeons and nurses and others so that they could take in new patients. I think it was maybe a 50%, I'm making this number up, but I think it was roughly a 50% increase in our capacity, which of course not only helped these women, but it's a profitable area of business to be in. So that was a total win. Taking less time is great. But if you're like my mother, who used to go to the bank teller on 79th and 3rd, removing the human contact also removes some of the emotion and emotional content that is also very valuable. We do this, I'm an internist, when you do this and put our patients who have heart failure on a low sodium diet or try to do that, the sodium adds so much flavor. How do you add the flavor back so that they can actually be comfortable with a low sodium diet. And so what the team did, which I thought was totally brilliant, um, I had no part in this, is they partnered with a, a group called Anna Ono that was founded by a breast cancer survivor. And she made all these garments and other things that were just sort of beautifully tailored things that, that made people who were undergoing breast reconstruction just more comfortable. And because this was a high margin field, we could afford to sort of give people discounts and give some of these products away. But there were these robes that could hold all of your Jackson Pratt drains and, and little devices. You can see that sort of shower bag. So you could take a shower and not have the drains dangling there. Uh, and there was, they gave these like chest buddies so that the shoulder belt would be padded over where you might've had a surgical site there. It was all packaged beautifully with a note from like they, they created these beautiful boxes with a, a note that looks sort of like a wedding invitation from the uh, chief of plastic surgery. It was all just this emotional content that was designed to add the salt back to, to a, a sodium free diet to make it more palatable to people. And the lesson there is that as we think about some of these ways in which we're going to automate care, because I am convinced automation of some form is the only way we're gonna get out of the various messes we have with clinician burnout and cost and access. Only through automation are we gonna be able to solve that. We're gonna to have to make sure that we don't give up on the emotion that is an essential ingredient uh, to all of this care. And so I'll, I'll sort of semi end on this quote that many of you have heard from Maya Angelou, the poet and really social activist who said that she's, you know, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And that's a fundamental part of the business that we're all in, no matter what part of medicine uh, that we're in, emotional content is critical. So I'll wrap this up here with a sense of sources of new value and innovation in health and healthcare. And I think they do come in the form of mRNA vaccines and CAR T cell therapy. But I also think that sources of new value come from better ways to engage people. A lot of that is tech-based communication. And as I've said, I've been amazed at 
some of the things that are going on at UCSF that I really am eager to transplant back uh, to Penn. Better ways to engage with people by understanding how behavior is created and can be motivated and better ways to engage people by retaining the emotional resonance and content of that. I am so optimistic about this field. It would never have occurred to me that we could advance healthcare by taking principles of design, like the people who design chairs and wine glasses and applying that to the way we deliver healthcare. But I think that is a, not, not a, maybe not a central part of our future, but a huge part of our future going forward. And I'm totally bullish on that. So I'll pause there. Or I'll stop there. I want to thank you for the, your time. It's been a tremendous honor to be able to speak with all of you today. Thank you, Dave. That was fabulous. Uh, let me start with a couple. I assume you have played with ChatGPT or GPT-4, any of that, those new toys. As you did that, uh, how did your brain begin spooling forward as to the impact of that as it reaches healthcare vis-a-vis -vis behavioral economics? How will we apply these tools that have the capacity to have much more of a conversational interaction with people than traditional tech? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So I will say that it, it, up to the like end of the year of 2022, I really did not think that, I thought AI was totally oversold. And, and it came from sort of my everyday experiences of being on the, on the phone, trying to talk to someone at my bank or an airline and having, no, I don't mean that. I don't mean like, you know, Phoenix, I mean, San Francisco. Oh, it was so irritating. And, and when we, we created a bunch of chat bots during the early days of the, not early days, yeah, the early days of the pandemic. And we were working with some tech firms and they said, yeah, well, they, we can only get that right about 85% of the time. And I was thinking, well, like, that's not the standard we we can use in healthcare. And then chat GPT comes along and I totally changed my mind mm -hmm. because I'm not sure about the accuracy part, but the fluency part was so amazing to me. And I'm, I'm, I'm really like, now I'm all gung ho about this. I was, I used chat GPT to write a, a little love sonnet to my beautiful wife. That was fun. You know, like it, it, it writes in poetry. And um, so I'm pretty, pretty enthusiastic, but I am of course worried about the garbage in garbage out problem mm -hmm. and the ability to amplify misinformation. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm pretty enthusiastic about it because I think it is it's got a kind of comforting fluency. Yeah, I'll do one more question then then open it up. Uh, the Jiffy Lube analogy uh, is interesting. In some ways, there's a tension between taking what let's say a generalist does, primary care doctor, and chopping it up into its Jiffy Lube parts. And comprehensiveness, continuity, fragmentation. So how do you sort of weigh the value of taking this, what we hope is a more holistic approach and then dividing it up into little pieces? Is there a cost there that you've got to try to understand and, and mitigate? So I'm a general internist and a few years ago, this guy decided that we should separate general internal medicine into something called primary care and this other thing that he called hospitalism. Oh, who, would, who would even think and of that? And he seemed to think that that was okay. <laughs> <laughs> you touché, right into touché, that touché. All right, and, um, and so, you know, I, I don't know, I think general, so uh, being a general internist, yeah. I am so used to parts of general internal medicine, I think I'm going to turn this into a general internal medicine story, yeah. is a great incubator for all sorts of things that then gets spun off, hospitalism, sports medicine, geriatrics, a bunch of, you know, palliative care, uh, palliative care yeah. and then research methods like epidemiology, health services research. I um, I think the world is, you know, I say some things stupidly cliche, it's getting different and we should like embrace some of those things. Right, right. Uh, questions? Yeah. And say who you are. And do you have any questions? Like uh, thanks again for being here. I'm Brandon Scott, I'm a hospitalist here. Um, to the Jiffy Lou reference, I love this idea of taking these well-described successful concepts in other industries that we don't even think about in healthcare. I think your talk spoke to this. Our industry is one where we do what we're used to, we do what's familiar, and I'd love your perspectives on overcoming those barriers of the change management, particularly when it comes to integrating things from other industries into ours. Yeah, I, I the change, you know, it is probably easier to change a person's mind than a corporations, you know, an institution. I think those cultural things are very hard. 
there, I, I do think that the analogy thing works. Talking about Jiffy Loop is an, as an analogy. People can understand that. We've done had other examples of that. I'll just give you one. Uh, for our colorectal cancer program, there's so, so the ERAS protocol suggests that everyone, I mean, you know, they should have some carbo loading right before surgery. They should wipe themselves down with chlorhexidine wipes and they should take preoperative antibiotics. And our hit rate to get all three of those was like zero until we thought of a blue apron approach and we sent sent people the whole package and then covered it with a little text message reminder. And I think we got it up beyond 85%. Showing that we could do that in an experiment before we asked permission was a huge, like, you know, jump-started our innovation. If you ask permission in advance, you get a lot of organizational, um, you know, that'll never work. It'll never work with this kind of group. It'll never work with the older people. It'll never work with the younger people. It'll never work with whatever. And if you do it first, and then show the results. So you need to have some, you know, sort of the confidence of your convictions. I think that has helped us out a lot at Penn. It does mean that when things go wrong, if they do go wrong, you take the blame because you never got anybody's permission. But um, for a lot of these things, it's actually very hard to go, to go wrong with that. So I, I think you lead with the answers to the, like you lead with a solution to a problem that people, uh, we, we have early evidence that it works. Thanks, Rita Redberg, cardiology, and great to have all these pen former and current I, I people. Know. Thanks, an excellent talk. Early, you mentioned that obviously paying people could increase their medications, and you did also use analogies from childcare and child rearing, and it seems like the same issue. You worry, well, you know, if you pay your kids to get good grades, you pay your patients to do what they're supposed to. What happens? Is the money is going to run out at some time. I mean, or, and will they translate that to then everything? They shouldn't do any of the things doctors say unless we're paying them. And I'm just wondering where you think that balance is. Is it a net plus or yeah. should we go for more intrinsic uh, motivation, which is yeah. certainly harder? Well, I've published a series of spectacularly negative studies of financial incentives in a, a journal called JAM Internal Medicine. <laughs> and um, so uh, he just took me on for hospital. He's taking Reed on as yeah. editor of the journal. Who's next? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is definitely going to be a two-way street. I, mean, I think I, David Earl, who is, his, who is his organic chemistry partner in, in college, will be next. We'll hear yeah, about that. Right. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so I, I, am, I believe there's a place for financial incentives, even in raising your kids. Um, uh, although you'd probably have to ask my kids uh, whether that worked out. Um, <laughs> But I'm not hugely enthusiastic about financial incentives. I'm really not. And um, they, you know, not only are they not so effective, they're sort of icky. Um, you know, I use a technical term. Um, uh, I don't know what the literature is in, in financial incentives for non-healthcare executives, you know, stock options and all of those things, things like most of us don't get. Um, uh, I'm unconvinced that they're huge motivators. I, uh, or for, for huge forces for good, frankly. Um, but I don't think that they've been particularly effective uh, in healthcare. And so I think we should largely be setting our sights elsewhere. But I would love for people to prove me wrong. Like any, you know, if it, if it works and it's not too expensive, like I'm not, I'm not morally against it. I'm just not sure that it's effect, as effective as people. Are you concerned about Rita's, Rita's issue that, that, that people get addicted to them? That like, oh, you're not paying me for this medicine. I won't take this one. Well, so I think so, but let let me just push back on that a little bit. So, if if you've got a patient with hypertension and you put them on whatever a thiazide diuretic, and their blood pressure gets controlled, a year later you don't say, well, let's see if we can withdraw the thiazide diuretic and see if it if your blood pressure stays. We don't. Our theory is that you need that drug forever or something mm -hmm. forever, and I think you might need the financial incentives forever, and so. Um, I'm not exactly pushing back on this particular point, but we could, if we think of it, if we think it's an effective therapy, then what's the problem with using it mm -hmm. for everything? As long as it's not breaking, we have to pay for the thiazide diuretic, yeah. which doesn't cost much. Maybe we should be paying for the financial incentive. It's not that expensive and it works. Why not? I think the problem is, is it going to, is the concern that then no one will do anything without financial incentives. Mm -hmm. I do worry about that dystopian future. Yeah. Dave. Great talk, David, and, and great to see you again. David Earl, uh, Associate Chair for Biomedical Research. So you focused on 
situations where, for example, compliance with a treatment that's known to be effective if adhered to is, is important. Um, I'm interested in, whether, in uh, thinking about how some of the things you're talking about might apply to clinical research. So of course, in many cases, we don't know the best thing to do for people. Um, and the participation of patients in clinical research is quite low. So I'm wondering if there are things that relate to what you've been talking about that have been successful or have high potential to be successful in encouraging both clinicians and, and patients to participate more. Yeah, I, I, I love the question. Before he answers, how was he in organic chemistry? Was he a good, good student? He, he was a great behavioral economist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Behavioral, behavioral economics is applied to carboxylic acids. Um, so uh, we've actually done a fair amount, as, as have other people done work in trying to think about opt-in versus opt-out consent approaches, things that will, will, will sort of grease the wheels of consent. Now, how appropriate those are depends often on, frankly, how risky the study is. And at one extreme, a lot of the work that I do is um, our RCTs of operational interventions within a health system to improve colorectal cancer screening, where it's actually hard to think of how you could hurt someone mm -hmm. with that. And there, I think the, the right answer, I'll just be declarative, is not to have consent at all, is to have waiver of consent. And, uh, and although that has freaked out a lot of people, um, there are strong validity reasons why you might want to have waiver of consent and, and enroll people in randomized control trials without their knowledge. Uh, and that is because you otherwise you might get very invalid um, results and you can't really hurt them and you're trying to encourage colorectal cancer screening. So under the right circumstances, and Penn, I think we were blessed with having a, in my mind, a progressive IRB that will tolerate a uh, uh, waiver of consent under the right circumstances. For a lot of clinical research, that's completely inappropriate because there's there are dangers involved, mm -hmm. and and then the, the the more you lean people into, you know, skidding into consent, the more you're actually taking away their autonomy and uh, which like in an inappropriate way is when they might be harmed, and so I think a lot of the challenges that I've seen in clinical research is applying rules from more dangerous trials and overgeneralizing them to trials where honestly we could have a more an approach that, I'm not trying to trick anyone into participating into a trial, but makes it easier for them to say yes or harder for them to say no without doing it in a way that anybody would find morally objectionable or that most people would not find morally. morally. There's always someone who's going to find what, what I'm doing morally objectionable. Um, that's that, like Those are some of the approaches that, that I think of. Now, I also think that I know there's some critical care physicians in the audience Harder to do that in settings where there is no pre-existing emotional connection. No one, no one has a critical care physician. You don't go in, you know, I'm going to go, you know, on Wednesday, I'm going to go get my A-line checked and my swan recalibrated. That doesn't happen. And so when people are like in a critical care setting, it's very hard to have like the emotional rapport. That's why I think it's hard to recruit people into clinical in critical care trials because there's people are scared. It's an immediate, you know, those kinds of emotional things are hard, hard to add the emotion into those settings. But I, I think consent is a is a huge issue for enrollment. And I think we're in a well-meaning way, a little hard on the research community. We're unfortunately at time, because this could go on forever. I, I loved it. I think the audience did us and Holly Smith would have as well. So thank you for doing it and for being with us. We really enjoyed it very much. Thanks. <laughs> thank you so much.